the land cruisers pass by signs indicating the beginning of the carnivore area. Although an attempt has been made to camouflage the 20-foot moats with foliage, they can still be seen in some places. You will notice that additional precautions have been taken to ensure your safety in the carnivore sections of the park. Large moats separate these ferocious dinosaurs away from the electric fences lining the entire road. The vehicles drive along a ridge above a fast-moving river. To your left, you'll see our Mesozoic Jungle River, where you may catch a glimpse of a very dangerous carnivore. Keep your eyes peeled, everyone. And there it is, Dilophosaurus. Two Dilophosaurs crouch by the river, drinking. Their ten-foot bodies spotted like leopards and hooting like owls. Dilophosaurus is one of the earliest carnivorous dinosaurs. Scientists thought their jaw muscles were too weak to kill but now we know they are poisonous. Tim grins. Hey, all right. Are they really poison, Mr. Regis? Well, yes, Lex. (laughs) A poisonous dinosaur. Grant's amazement belies his concern. Regis attempts to assuage his fears. We keep well away from them on the tour. Along with such living reptiles as Gila monsters and rattlesnakes, Dilophosaurus secretes a toxin and glands in its mouth. These amazing animals spit and blind their prey with venom. Unconsciousness follows within minutes. The dinosaur then finishes the victim off at its leisure, making Dilophosaurus a beautiful but deadly addition to Jurassic Park. Lex has gone pale with worry. Inside the control room, Hammond's expression mirrors Lex's. Change that recording about poison. It's too frightening for kids. This is a wonderful prehistoric world. I don't want them to be scared. Well, dinosaurs are a little scary in reality. I don't care about reality. We make the reality. I didn't spend four billion dollars in ten years to make a park that scares little kids. Change the message. Dennis Nedry sits at his terminal in the corner, working. Hammond now turns his attention to Nedry. How's the computer coming, Dennis? It's coming. This computer has been nothing but a headache from the beginning. Well, maybe if you paid me my fees when they were due. Well, maybe if you had done it right in the first place, Dennis. I did it right. You kept changing the specs. We had to change the specs, Dennis. The computer was malfunctioning. Okay. Let's not start this again. It's a large system, and there are bound to be glitches. Arnold attempts to distract Hammond. You can see your kids are by the Tyrannosaurus area now. As the tropical sunlight fades, the land cruisers enter a new landscape of forests, fields, and marshland. The vehicles don't stop. We'll stop to see Tyrannosaurus on our way back, but we are passing her habitat now, and you might catch a glimpse of her to your left. Everyone stares intently out to the left. There's a bit of luck involved since Tyrannosaurus conceals herself during the day. It's because she has sensitive skin and sunburns easily. Keep looking. Below they see an unearthly landscape, as if transported back millions of years. There are wisps of faint fog on the ground. But no Rex. Well, don't worry. We'll have another chance on our way back. Right now we go on to a fascinating animal, the Triceratops. Malcolm speaks through the intercom. What's that ship? Through a gap in the foliage, they see a distant ship at a loading dock with a few lights. That's our supply ship. Comes about every two weeks, bringing food for the animals. They eat so much we can't possibly grow it on the island. The sky is growing darker, lower, and menacing. Thunder growls through the air. Hmm. Looks like rain. Hope we can finish the tour before it starts coming down. Inside the control room, one monitor shows the land cruisers on the tour. Another shows the supply boat. The radio phone begins to whine. Nedry works at his desk, unbothered. Uh, John, this is the Ann B at the loading dock. Do you read me? Over. Reading you, Ann B. Go ahead, Freddy. Uh, John, looks like there's a storm coming. We've got falling barometric BPF and satellite forecast plus hurricane force winds by midnight. I'd like to head back to the mainland earlier than scheduled. Nedry's head snaps around. He stares, stunned. That sounds prudent, Freddy. 
you get all the people who are going to the mainland for the weekend down here, I really think we should leave the island in the next hour. Nedry mouths Freddy's words. The next hour? He is inexplicably upset. Everyone else is matter of fact. Safety is paramount. If you think you need to leave, well, let everyone go early. I think it's best. Okay, Freddy. Keep us informed. Nedry bites his lip. Arnold turns to Hammond. I just hope our tour doesn't get drenched when the storm hits. Nedry suddenly gets up, excuse me, and bolts out of the room in clear distress. What's the problem? Uh, He's got a bad stomach. He's sensitive. You shouldn't yell at him, John. I didn't yell at him. You yelled at him. Well, just a little. In the hallway outside the control room, Nedry looks around quickly. He enters a narrow electrical walk space on the other side of the control room. Nedry moves past the wiring, some big panels with wires, boxes, and unused monitors. In the back, he set up a little secret place. A monitor shows a supply boat. Nedry picks up the phone and begins to talk. What are you talking about? Leaving early? You can't leave early. Gotta do it. The storm. But it's all planned. It's been planned for months. Tomorrow at dawn. There's a storm, Dennis. But, but, what do you want from me? But You got something to get on this ship? You better have it here in the next hour. But I can't. We're in the middle of a tour. Not my problem, Dennis. Get your stuff here in an hour or see you next time. Nedry comes back into the control room, gloomy and tense. Are you feeling all right, Dennis? Hammond asks solicitously. Yeah. Nedry is too preoccupied to notice. He goes to his terminal and sits. I want to apologize for what I said before, Dennis. I was not thinking. Oh. Okay, yeah, thank you. Is everything all right? Yeah, yeah, fine. Where are they on the tour now? They've just reached the Triceratops paddock. The land cruisers stop before a Triceratops, which stands quietly. It has a huge, bulky body, like a rhinoceros. Nearby is the park ranger, Muldoon. The group approaches the animal head-on. Wow, a real Triceratops. Why isn't it moving? He's sick. What's he sick with? We're not sure. He's being checked by our park ranger, Mr. Muldoon. The Triceratops' mouth is propped open, and it wheezes as Muldoon scrubs the teeth with a brush like a hockey stick. Muldoon glances back at the approaching guests. The illness. A complete mystery. These guys are very fragile. It sounds strange, but they get severe tooth decay, then massive infection spreads to the oral cavity, and they die. Ellie shakes her head. Fatal tooth decay? Fossil skeletons don't show decay. I know, but there's apparently been a change in bacteria in the last hundred million years. We've lost three animals so far. Grant runs his hand over the rough hide, touching the skin which has numerous abrasions. Tim touches tentatively, too. Grant examines the toes and notices that the nails are cracked. How about dietary change? Any strange plant they eat now? Not that I know, but I'd be glad for your help, Dr. Sadler. Any thoughts you have? Easy, girl. Got a little spinach between your teeth. Muldoon plunges his rubber-gloved hand elbow-deep into her mouth and comes out with a huge wad of green. Ellie pokes through the green mush, while Lex looks on, horrified. Muldoon next takes a ball of heavy twine, unspooling a little. Now, I'll just floss her. Easy. This is interesting. Amelia Zetarak, China Bear Leaves. You have any culture swabs? Help yourself, in my bag. What's China Berry? It's a plant with toxic effects on bacteria. Could be changing the microecology of this animal's oral cavity. Ellie talks almost to herself. Lex nods, as if understanding. Look here. See this? 
That's the berry, and see it has a coating? Regis turns to Muldoon, concerned. Uh, any chance this decay problem might be picked up by a visitor? Not unless you French kiss her. <laughs> no. People can't catch it. Oh, girl. Muldoon rolls his eyes. Whew. Lex waves her hand in front of her face. Whew. Regis checks his watch. Perhaps it's time to resume the park tour. It'll be dark soon. I'd like to stay here for a while. Collect more samples. I have a few more questions about this illness. I'll bring her back with me, Ed, if you want to go on ahead. Fine, let's go. See you all back at the center. They start off towards the cars. Almost imperceptibly, Ellie blows Grant a kiss. He winks back. It's getting dark. Maybe we can't see the wrecks on the way back. Ah, don't worry about that. Have you ever used night vision goggles, Tim? They let you see in the dark. (laughs) Neat! I want to use them too. You get to do everything, Timmy. The kids start to bicker, climbing back into the car. Grant and Malcolm look back at the Triceratops as the Land Cruisers begin to pull away. Grant shakes his head. Tooth decay. Fatal. Small example of things going out of control. Small things. Grant looks back. You suppose they're having trouble with other animals and not telling us? Yes, I think there's a great deal they're not telling us. But we'll find it out sooner or later. Inside the control room, Hammond stands before big windows that overlook the rotunda. He turns and looks at the electronic map. Land cruisers are heading back. That's right. They make one more stop by the Tyrannosaur. It's a rest stop. How long do they stop there? About ten minutes. Then they come straight home. They'll be back here in about thirty minutes. Nedry glances at his watch, nervously, and frowns. He starts to type at his console. Initiate sequence. I'll be right back. I gotta, I, I gotta get a Coke. Don't touch my console, okay? I'm transmitting. Screw up my data. Nedry leaves the control room. At his console screen, numbers start ticking backwards. At the Tyrannosaurus paddock, the tour cars approach a partially sunken rest area. Excellent idea. Everyone gets out of the cars. In the hallway, Nedry stops outside the door to the fertilization lab. He holds a ticking stopwatch in his hands and waits. The red light by the card slot goes out and the door thunks ajar. The fertilization lab is deserted. The interior is divided into cylindrical slots. He goes past the barriers. All security is off. He enters the walk-in freezer. Shelves of reagents from floor to ceiling fill the freezer. Nedry finds a nitrogen cold box with a ceramic door. He opens it, and a rack of small tubes slide out in a white liquid nitrogen smoke. Embryos are arranged by species in glass with silver foil. Nedry puts two of each into a portable incubator. He pours in liquid nitrogen before closing the lid. He locks it and places it back in his bag. Nedry walks out into the hallway. The coast is clear, but he can hear voices in the distance. In the rotunda, workmen continue to assemble the Tyrannosaurus skeleton. Hammond talks to them about the skeletons. I just wonder if the head has to be in that position, if it couldn't be more lifelike. Nobody sees as Nedry slips past in the background and heads for the elevator. The elevator opens in the basement. Nedry heads past rows of land cruisers. He goes directly to a corrugated steel roll-up door in the wall. A sign reads, Park Ranger Only. Nearby is the security card slot with its light out. Nedry rolls up the door, revealing a gas-powered jeep inside. He starts the engine. Nedry drives fast into the night and comes to a gate marked Electric Fence, 10,000 volts. He opens it with his bare hands and drives through. At the maintenance building, Nedry hops out of the jeep and runs inside. The lights are still on as Nedry enters. He finds the main phone terminal. 
and turns off the switches. In the control room, Arnold appears relaxed for the first time. Wu enters. We better notify the dining room. Make sure they've prepared everything before everyone takes off for the boat. Those kids will probably be starving when they get back. Arnold picks up the phone and hears hissing modem static. What's this? What's going on? He tries punching another line. Huh. What's the matter? The phones are out. The lines must be tied up by Nedry's transmission. That shouldn't affect our internal calls. Nedry's console continues sequentially through labels that turn gray. Security. Off. Vehicle power. Off. Electric fences. Off. No one is looking at Nedry's console. Nedry drives hard. He holds up a stopwatch to check elapsed time. Tires squeal as he takes a turn fast. At the rest stop, Lex and Tim stand on an overlook above the park. Tim fiddles with his goggles. Lex just looks. Hearing squealing tires, she frowns at a car with headlights moving through the darkening park toward the ship in the farther distance. Finally, at the loading dock, Nedry swings the perimeter fence wide. Beyond, in bright light, the ship is tied up. Nedry drives forward and then hurries aboard. Once on the ship, Nedry approaches the captain, Freddy. So, you made it. You're going to be rich. They owe me. And you owe me, my friend. Just get it to the mainland by morning and make sure it stays frozen. Through his night vision goggles, Tim watches as Nedry hands the captain the shoulder bag containing the embryo incubator. Hey, I can see Mr. Nedry. Tim follows Nedry as he gets back into his car, then looks back to the captain, who takes the incubator out of Nedry's shoulder bag. What's he doing there? Here, let me see. Grant puts on the night vision goggles. Mr. Nedry already left in that car. But he gave the captain something. It looked like one of those embryo incubators we saw in the lab. Grant focuses on the captain, who hides the incubator. I see it. Better have somebody check this out. Grant looks to Regis. You have a radio in the car? Sure. Why? Grant briskly heads back to the cars. Regis follows reluctantly. Call the control room and notify the boat. I think you've got an embryo incubator on that boat. Regis reaches into the car and takes out the radio headset. Control, this is Ed. Control, over. Regis turns to Grant, skeptical. You really think you saw an incubator on the boat? Yeah, I do. Control, this is Ed. Control, hello? Grant just stares. Regis shakes the headset. Control? Muldoon, anyone? Control? He shakes the headset again. Radio's dead again. Again? We've had some problems with our communications equipment. Problems with your communications equipment? Health problems with the animals? You have quite a lot of... problems. Let's head back. Come on, everybody, into the cars. How long will it take to get back? About 20 minutes, but... I assure you, there's no reason to be alarmed. Grant gives him a piercing look. Come on, kids. We're heading back. Everyone gets back into the tour cars. Regis sits in front and notices that the whole dashboard is dead. He starts flipping buttons, but nothing happens. He looks relieved. Ugh. Well, no wonder the radios don't work. We have no power. Regis picks up the handheld intercom. Dr. Grant? No power here. Can we call the control room with these radios? Or... Muldoon? No, it's too far. Beyond range. Can we call anybody? Not until we get power, no. You mean we just have to sit here? How long will it take that ship to reach the mainland? 18 hours. It won't arrive until noon tomorrow, but don't worry, we'll get the power back on in a few minutes, then we'll straighten out all of your concerns. In the rotunda of the visitor center, the workmen are getting ready to leave. Hammond is still explaining what he wants. When you come back, make it more menacing. 
More alive? Can't we twist it around so it is menacing that herbivore? You want to move the whole skeleton again? Hammond imitates the poses he wants. A Tyrannosaurus Rex should be fierce. Snapping. Fierce. All the workmen head out. Arnold and Wu look down through the control room windows into the rotunda, where Hammond is a snapping, snarling Rex in a suit. How many times do you think he'll make them move it? Hmm. At least ten times. This will go on for weeks. He's a perfectionist. Chuckling, they head back to the consoles. What happened to your monitors? What's that? Your park monitors. They're all out. Sure enough, computer screens still glow, but monitors showing views of the park are black. Arnold punches buttons. What the hell? You lose power? I don't know. They must still be at the rest stop near the Tyrannosaur Hill. If the power's out, they're not going anywhere. Call maintenance and find out what happened. Wu picks up one of the phones and still hears hissing. No phones. Damn Nedry. John, look. Wu points dramatically at the park map. Your electric fences are off. Wait, what? All over the park, it looks like. <sighs> oh my god. The electric fences are off. 